this is the focus of today's presentation. Service transition looks at the long-term practices of change management and release management. It is very closely affiliated or associated with risk management, meaning that when we are managing a change to our environment, we want to certainly mitigate risks. Many organizations actually have been eager to implement change management for the very reason that they are required either by corporate governance or by external regulations to provide records to auditors related to changes made to their infrastructure. So if you are a medical practice or you have sensitive student data or certainly if you are a government customer that's dealing with a lot of sensitive data, you have to have records of who has access to the data and if there are changes to particular equipment, whether it be servers or workstations that have access to that data, you have to have a record if there are any modifications made to that infrastructure. When we receive the handoff from service design, we're getting a service design package handed off from service design that informs our our activities for service transition, we then have, again, a design package that meets the needs of the business and we want to be sure that we continue to enable these beneficial changes for the business while at the same time mitigating risk and making it easier for our own IT organization for ongoing operations. This, the processes that I will review in service transition include IT service asset and configuration management, change management, release and deployment management, and knowledge management. I'm going to abbreviate um, IT service asset and configuration management as ITSACM, um, or I may refer to it as just configuration management. This has gone through a little bit of a met metamorphosis over the years. Originally, we used to talk about asset or inventory management. And then I believe it was decided that, well, that really was more about the financial end of things. And in IT, we really want to be concerned with the infrastructure and the relationships between and among components. So it was renamed to configuration management in version 2 of IDLE. And then I believe there may have been some thought as to, well, you know, that's fine for IT, but we do still need to have appropriate record keeping for our components. So they glommed it all together, added IT service at the beginning, and now we get this very long name of IT service asset and configuration management. So those are some of the aspects of that particular process. In addition to the four processes that we'll discuss, um, I will also outline some of that, the activities the activities include transition planning and support, which is related very closely to change management, service validation and testing related to release and deployment management, and then change evaluation, which again is logically related to change management, highlighted in blue here because again it was introduced or actually the name was changed in IDLE 2011. So it was changed from evaluation to change evaluation to be more specific. So let's take a look at the processes in more detail. So the first process that I had on the list was ITSACM. Some of the important definitions and things to understand about this process. Um, CI is a term that you may have heard already. Um, a CI is a configuration item that is under the control of configuration management. There's typically a dollar amount associated with a particular component to determine whether it's going to be tracked and managed. So keyboards, for example, are not considered typically um, to be CIs. Usually the amount that I hear from my customers is anywhere from five, five, excuse me, 500 to $1,000 to be considered a CI. They typically include hardware and software, and not just PCs or servers, but any component, whether it be a router or other networking component or anything within the infrastructure. 
CI specification and relationship data can inform all other IT processes for better decision making. This is an important point. Um, it's, it relates to one of the stories I tell when I teach my IDLE V3 foundation certification classes. So there's a story that about a service desk analyst who receives a call and the end user indicates that, that they just have a sticky key on their keyboard. So the service desk analyst advises the end user to pick up his keyboard about a foot off the desk and, and just drop it down on the desk and, in the hopes that this will dislodge the keyboard. Or not the keyboard, sorry, dislodge the, uh, the letter or sticky key on the keyboard. So the end user follows the directions and indicates that, well, his laptop really isn't working at all anymore. Had the service desk analyst known that it was a laptop that he was supporting and not a desktop with a separate keyboard, then it would have informed his decision and the advice that he provided to that end user. That's just a minor example. Certainly when you look at things like change management and how changes um, are managed, then it's very important to understand if, for example, we make a change to a particular component, to understand what other components will also be impacted. I've added this other, this last point here. It's not something that we normally teach, but certainly I feel it's an important point to make, is that all CI should be under the control of change management. So if we have a particular component that's going to be changed, and that uh, it should be then managed through the change process, which we'll review in more detail in a few moments. So I've had people ask me, well, you know, aren't there some things that we can change without really recording them? Because, you know, if we're just making a tiny little modification, if you want to keep your configuration management system and your CI information up to date, it's important to have all of the CIs under the control of change management. One thing that we do review in our classes is that when you take the baseline or you identify the baseline of a particular component, and you then compare that component, that baseline to a future state. So say I take the baseline of my laptop when it's first deployed. If I look at my laptop and its configuration a year from now, the baseline should equal, or I'm sorry, the snapshot a year from now should equal the baseline plus any approved changes that were recorded and applied to this component. So I should not have any changes to a particular configuration item that were not approved through the change management process. And that especially applies for major components, um, servers, and so on. It is up to the organization to determine what constitutes a, a change, and we'll look at that a little bit in a few moments as well. Um, but certainly, configuration management and change management are very closely tied together in that way. Some other key terms in configuration management. It used to be that the CMDB was the holy grail. It was felt that if you could develop a, an accurate and maintain, more importantly, an accurate CMDB, that all would be right with your IT support organization. The reality, though, was that most organizations had a number of federated sources of data. So these federated CMDBs, each containing separate stores of CI data, can now be integrated or at least um, consolidated into a single CMS or configuration management system. In version 3, IDLE does make um, specific recommendations related to the usage of automated, this, uh, automated tools and for configuration management, specifically automated discovery tools. Something that we've found in helping our customers maintain CI information or these CI records is that this data can become outdated very quickly. With an automated discovery tool, it helps you to do regular snapshots of your infrastructure and to keep 
those CMDBs and your CMS um, up to date without having to do a lot of manual entry. A component of your CMS should be a DML or Definitive Media Library. The Definitive Media Library used to be called the Definitive Software Library in version 2. In version 3, however, in addition to being including the actual software, they've also expanded it to include the licensing and documentation information. The media, the media library is, during in this time, more likely to be a some type of storage drive or network drive that contains downloadable uh, files, or it could even be just links to um, or web links that could allow you to download the software. So you should be tracking where, what the locations are for your software. You're not likely to have any more this big cabinet with all sorts of disks and CDs and so on. But we still have this concept of the DML where we maintain the records for the, uh, the source of all of our software licensing and documentation. So I mentioned that change management and configuration management are tightly related together. You really can't have one without the other. In change management, we want to enable changes. We're not trying to prevent changes um, that will be benefit the business while making sure that we have minimal disruptions and really we don't want to be causing any incidents because of a change that we've made. One of the important reasons for having change management would be to alert the organization when a change is going to be made. Um, I have lots of stories from speaking to customers and going out on the road. And I had a customer tell me the story of his security department that decided that 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning would be a good time to change the Windows security policy. So suddenly, unawares, his service desk is flooded with calls related to this security policy. People were unable to log in or were they um, were getting kicked out and had to change their passwords. <clears throat> so certainly we want to prevent those types of incidents. <coughs> Excuse me, and if we can't prevent the incidents, if there is a mistake or other type of failure, then we at least want to make sure that through change management we have the appropriate lines of communication. So again, going back to that RACI matrix, we want to make sure with change management that we understand who needs to be consulted and who needs to be conformed. And don't leave out the service desk. We want to establish guidelines and procedures. There will often need to be multiple levels of approval. Approval is will be determined by the level of change that's being made. So we have what we call various levels of change authority. So there may be a simple change that might just need the uh, signature or approval of somebody on the service desk, whereas large infrastructure changes may need the approval of the full corporate board of directors. So again, it depends on the, uh, the scope of the change being made. <clears throat> and also, it's recommended that anybody within the organization have the ability to submit requests for change. So there should be a process or mechanism that allows the customers or end users to request changes to features of a particular piece of software or perhaps submit a request for a new um, service or a new piece of software to allow them to do, do their jobs better. And there are ways that you can extend your change management tools to make them available through a mid-tier or self-service interface. 